Courageous Conversations was launched in 2020 in the midst of the racial reckoning following the death of George Floyd, Regis Korpinski Parkett, in order to have conversations around difficult and contentious issues that were happening and around which we needed to increase knowledge and awareness. So for example, around systemic racism, around racial profiling, um, and around efforts to come to terms with what is to be done. We found two people who inspired these kinds of conversations historically and today, one of whom is Violet King, a Calgarian, who became the first black woman lawyer, and the other was Maya Angelou, the African-American author and poet who said that courage is the most important virtue because without courage, you cannot do anything else consistently. What inspires me is having the conversations with these leading thinkers from across campus, the country and around the world, who have been thinking deeply about these issues, who have been engaged with uh, social justice movements, with university communities, with other intellectuals and activists, with an aim not just for understanding, but also for thinking about how the understanding can be mobilized in order to affect sustainable change. Good afternoon and welcome. My name is Dr. Melinda Smith and I'm the Vice Provost and Associate Vice President Research, Equity, Diversity and Inclusion at the University of Calgary in Calgary, Alberta, Canada. It is my distinct honor to welcome you to the second Courageous Conversation event of 2022. Sorry, the first Courageous Conversation event of 2022. Um, Courageous Conversation uh, is a speaker series designed from the outset to hold difficult conversations about we may call the wicked pro social problems of our time, about the big issues of the moment. It aims to ignite honest and challenging dialogues that we at universities, in our cities, and around the world need to embrace if we are to address and ameliorate the social injustices of our time. The conversations are designed to help illuminate the issues, but also to provide us with a guidepost on how we can work together at our universities, in our cities, and beyond to combat injustice and to build more fair, equitable, sustainable, and inclusive pathways. As importantly, if not more so, this particular series in 2021, 2022, is designed to help us think deeply about the issue of decolonization and what it means beyond decolonization as a metaphor to think about decolonizing our disciplines, our curriculum, our university. Before we begin this conversation, I would like to take this opportunity to acknowledge the traditional territories of the people of Treaty 7 region here in Southern Alberta, where University of Calgary is located. This includes the Blackfoot Confederacy comprising the Siksika, the Bikunai and Kainai First Nations, as well as the Sutsina First Nation and the Stony Nakoda, including the Chiniki, the Bearspaw and the Wesley First Nations. The city of Calgary is also home to the Métis Nation of Alberta Region 3. Today, we will be talking about 
decolonizing disciplines and structures of inequality. And our two speakers, I would two leading intellectuals from Canada and the United Kingdom, uh, Dr. Kaminda Bambra of the University of Sussex in the United Kingdom, and Dr. Yolan Buka of Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. Um, normally we have a serious elder um, who is uh, Elder Colleen Sitting Eagle, uh, who was not able to join us at the outset, but hopefully uh, would be able to join us um, later on in, in the series. But she has been the serious elder um, from the outset. Um, so before we launch into discussion then, let me introduce our first speaker. Our first speaker is Dr. Yolan Buka, and you can see um, who is an assistant professor at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario. She is an interdisciplinary scholar and practitioner whose research and teaching focus on gender, violence, decoloniality, race, and international relations and African affairs. The key dr questions driving her multidisciplinary research agenda are how vulnerable groups understand and navigate structural and political violence, and how these experiences influence the post-conflict social and political landscape. I will now turn the virtual floor over to Dr. Yolan Buka. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you're located. I'd like to begin with an acknowledgement that I am actually currently uh, situated in Toronto on the traditional unceded territory of the Algonquin and Anishinaabeg people. And I am raising my family here uh, as someone who came as a child to Canada um, and left to another settler colonial state, the United States, um, for my education and then decided to come back a few years later. So there is a lot to think about for me routinely as um, I live in this space and work in this space and raise children um, and Black children in this space. So I would like to first and foremost thank Dr. Melinda Smith for the kind and generous invitation uh, to participate in this Generative Courageous Conversation speaker series. I'm delighted to be able to share this platform with somebody I admire, uh, Dr. Bambra, who's an intellectual giant in the space of decolonization and decolonizing the university. Some of the thoughts and ideas that I'm going to share today are part of an ongoing conversation that I've had with a former graduate student of mine, Kiana Gallucci. Uh, we've been trying to work on this co-authored paper uh, in the virtual space in the midst of uh, the, the revolution and also in the midst of COVID as an exercise of peer-to-peer -peer teaching, as an exercise of mentoring and doing an F the excavation work that is necessary for the creation of uh, decolonial place spaces and a decolonial praxis. Um, the topic of my remarks today uh, takes on some of the broader debates of decolonizing the academy and tries to see how they fit and how they evolved when it comes to the field of African studies. Um, like many other area studies, African studies has often been defined and constituted um, across broad interdisciplinary practices, and it looks at the social and cultural, political and economic development on the continent of Africa, which is the location of many, many different countries and different people. Uh, it's been documented, however, that area studies like African studies um, are kind of emerge as part of, um, you know, some of the some of the post-war international relations and foreign policy imperatives of Western countries, notably uh, the United States. Um, and this particular trajectory has influenced the ways in which we understand African studies today. And of course, there were many waves of resistance and, and efforts in reshaping African study to what it is currently. 
Um, but the story of origin of the discipline in the university, particularly in the West, is very firmly grounded in this history. I situate myself as an African woman of Togolese origin. I was born in Europe, but I was raised in Canada and educated in the United States. I continue to have a strong personal and intellectual and professional ties to East, Southern and Western Africa, but I am also formed in many ways by the intellectual tradition in the Western ac Academy. I was trained in political studies and international relations in institutions that range from very conservative to neorealist and to neoliberal. And after my PhD, I thought that academia was not a place for me. So I moved out and started doing uh, the work of um, conflict analysis and prevention in East and Central Africa. It's really not until I started working in the security sector with fellow African researchers, academics and activists that I started discovering and properly engaging with critical scholarship. So for me, this is recent and I'm quite excited about this scholarship because I feel like I'm a novice in a place where a lot of people have been talking about these issues for quite a long time. Today, part of my work has been mentioned, looks at political violence, gender, state society relations and decoloniality. And I'm particularly interested in understanding how people navigate and make choices when living through context of violence, whether physical violence or structural. Um, so my intellectual point of departure for this conversation has been one of unlearning since I've returned to academia. I think, you know, I try to think about how I do my research and how to walk with my students on this path to unsettle my discipline. As such, my objective today is to take you on this walk on how Kiana and myself have exchanged on decolonizing African studies. For one, I think we have to acknowledge that despite the what we call the resurgence of the calls and proliferation of new strategies to the center Eurocentric approaches to the, the, the discipline, many of these decolonial initiatives still originate from the university, whose main function has been to perpetuate hierarchies between producers and subjects of knowledge. Globally, the modern university as a site of knowledge production and validation finds its roots in the establishment of colonial universities around the world. As such, most institutions of higher education were modeled after this colonial pattern. Therefore, at its foundation, the modern university sets out to privilege enlightenment ethics, Eurocentric and androcentric ways of being and knowing, and thereby assesses knowledge in ways that dismiss indigenous intellectual practices. In Africa, while nationalist universities such as Université Cheikh Anta Diop in Senegal or Ibadan University in Nigeria were established as sites of intellectual resistance, the reality remains that decolonizing in academia is in many ways antithetical as a project. But perhaps one of the most daunting aspects of decolonizing African studies within the walls of the university is a dual task of deconstructing um, colonial ideologies of modernity, Western superiority, and anti-Blackness in a field of inquiry that was originally created to subjugate the Black other for imperial purposes, while, and you have to do all this, while reclaiming and reimagining approaches to studying Africa, a place, an idea whose contours in the academy remain stubbornly in the image of its European invention. To be sure, um, African studies has grown and has evolved since inception in the West as an academic field of study. And we have intellectual, intellectual, African intellectuals and giants and activists who have dedicated their work to centering African people, their agency and their ways of knowing and being as the raison d'être of their scholarship, away from utilitarian and othering approaches. The field also benefited from the labor of dedicated decolonial scholars from around the world who have normalized critiques of Eurocentrism and modernity. The decolonial project is not uniquely indigenous, African or Asian. It is, but in each place, the process and many of the claims are quite different. Over the decades, this has resulted in the emergence of alternative sites of knowledge exchanges and validation, rejecting North American and European intellectual gatekeeping. 
some African universities that had not already done so at independence started shifting their pedagogical focus on African-based scholarship. Some students have mobilized and continue to do so um, for those changes to be implemented. In recent years, you can think about Roads Must Fall in South Africa as an example. Black and African professionals and academics created their own professional associations in arts, sciences, and humanities. In North America, the creation of the Black Caucus in 1968 and the subsequent creation of the African Heritage Studies Association at the Montreal meeting of the African Studies Association in 1969 really marked the rejection of the racist intellectual practices of this particular association. Black and African development emancipatory platforms and entire research enterprises beyond the Western gaze have been developed. One example is uh, academic periodicals like Feminist Africa that push back against hegemonic economies of knowledge production and create spaces for scholarship from the continent. It, is in turn, it has in turn made it possible for scholarship by African scholars to be more visible. And the key word here is visible. But beyond that, over the past decades, scholars and African students from Africa and the diaspora advocated for and engaged in the reclaiming of African ontologies and epistemologies. Despite these positive changes, because there have been many, we are still far from the transformation that is needed to decolonize African studies. We continue to observe the prevalence of colonial thought and practices in the field. Scholarship by African and Black scholars in the diaspora continue to be less visible and less cited than knowledge produced by white scholars. Many Africa-based scholars continue to be exploited by Western scholars due to discrimination and loop-sided financial and power dynamics. But even when African and Black scholarship is valorized, what work, the work itself is not always critical of coloniality and often unquestionably relies on concepts created for in and by the West. Relatedly, there remains skepticism about the legitimacy of African epistemologies, and there are still very limited outlets that value research publication in African languages. But perhaps, and for me most disconcerting, is the ways in which the resurgence of the decolonial movement and its discourses have been co-opted and commodified by the neoliberal academy. Within academia, a lot of labor has been put forth to put forth to push Western institution intellectual uh, to wrestle more actively with the literature and the project of decolonizing African studies and other fields of inquiry. But this wrestling has manifested itself to the proliferation of conferences and panels and blog posts and articles beyond the topic of African studies, of course. However, the popularization of decolonization as a concept has not been matched with equal consideration of its emancipatory objectives, which has allowed some scholars to misuse and sadly to instrumentalize the colonial narratives while maintaining the status quo and even elevating their own status. Here, the marketization of emancipatory ideas without emancipatory commitment and transformation operate as technologies of coloniality whereby existing power structures are preserved and made more efficient under the cloak of decolonization. As such, the decolonial project in its genuine liberation form remains necessary. So if I had the time today, I would walk you through the long genealogy of decolonial work on Black and African intellectual thought and struggle. And I will share a few here below, but and I'll also share a little bit later why I talk about Black and African. As I mentioned in, um, you know, in, in 2020, uh, in 2022, um, you know, as we are today, there's a really a great interest in the idea of decolonial work. Um, and there's a lot of people who we should be reading and familiarizing ourselves um, with. But some of these scholars often kind of try to replicate the violence of discovery through how they disseminate their reflections on, the, on ideas that, without acknowledging the intellectual labor of those who have come before us. As a Black person living in a diaspora, I've been thinking a lot about how African and Black scholars have undertaken, um, you know, research and thinking about, you know, what we know and how we research and teach on Africa. So let's kind of walk through like in 30 seconds, you know, over the past 100 years, 
you've had intellectual centers, you've had, you know, movement of intellectual resistance. Some of them can include the Negritude movement, um, you know, who were, that was kind of buttressed uh, uh, from Aimé Césaire and Suzanne Césaire. Uh, former President Senghor of Senegal was also a part of this Negritude movement. The Pan-Africanist movement uh, with Amy Jack Garvey, the B.B. Du Bois, and former President Nkrumah, who were part of this intellectual movement and political movement in many ways. Black consciousness with Steve Biko and Franz Fanon, and Franz Fanon can kind of move along different types of intellectual streams. And you have also scholars of decolonial and anti-colonial work, such as Nlovo Gacheni, who's, who's a professor whose work, uh, uh, you know, people who do work in African studies and decolonizing the African studies as a field really rely on. Cabral, who was a, a freedom fighter, but also an intellectual, talked about resistance in all its forms in a book. And of course, Oyeronke Oyewumi as a feminist giant uh, and intellectual that thinks not only about gender, but also about power. And there are many more, and there are many publications that talk to us about how to bring about uh, epistemic freedom in Africa, notably Dr. Nlovu Gacheni. So we have to think about these thinkers and we need to think about these intellectuals and listen and read to what they say on our way to decolonizing our own practices. There were wars of liberation that were fought in Southern Africa. There were rebellions of land reclamations and insurgencies, labor movements articulating the, the violence of colonialism and racism. And many of these events have been documented and intellectualized in current research. Now, some people less familiar with African studies and its debates may, may wonder why I engage with scholars of the diaspora and not just exclusively African scholars. I've already situated myself in my intellectual trajectory in a number of time in these presentations, but I didn't do this to trivialize the exercise of positionality. Instead, it comes back to how I learn about and read through and write, continue to write and teach about decolonization. This intellectual trajectory lends itself to having a clear understanding of anti-Blackness as something that is pervasive in African studies as well. Yes, today you have many Black and African scholars who have been able to throw their elbows and make some space for themselves in a discipline that was initially not created for their own use. But the dominant logics that inform which research is considered relevant, who gets a job, who will get published, and who will get the funding to do research remains anchored in many ways in Enlightenment thinking of who, of who is of the mind and who is of the body. Here I'm thinking about Descartes, je pense, donc je suis, I think, therefore I am. These logics continue to influence our thinking about who can reason and who can theorize and who is limited to illustration and description. Not that these two components are not important, but they're often devalued in our disciplines. It also informs in our institutions whose labor can be exploited and whose time can be protected or can be neglected. This is where the scholarship on race and anti-Blackness resonates the loudest for me and despite institutional performances of diversity and inclusion in different places. When I read Sylvia Winter's unsettling of the coloniality of, of being, power, truth, and freedom, and how she explains the overrepresentation of man, and here she talks about the white bourgeois man, and traces its absolute opposite, when I find myself is actually at the actual opposite. Um, though now I can consider myself in many ways bourgeois because I am in the academy. So I think about conversation with scholars as, such as Robin Mitchell, who writes about, uh, you know, uh, you know, black women and colonial fantasies in, in France, or Oyeronke or, Oyewumi, or, and many others who talk about black, and in this case, black women's condition globally. How do you decolonize a discipline that was not created for you or by you, but was created to subjugate you and others? So I link the study of Africa and all its diversity to the study of the diaspora, not because blackness defines all the people involved, but because as a scholar who studies power and international relations, I'm really invested in the way and interested in the ways in which blackness and anti-blackness and what the boys call the color line have influenced the trajectory of black and African people around the world. <laughs> 
So critical scholars of coloniality and social sciences will often talk about ontological and epistemological violence, which impacts continue to promote and reinforce an unequal distribution of power and knowledge production between the West and the rest. Citing Gugi Wathiongo and Goody, Novo Gacheni explains uh, that Africa is a place where there were epistemic sites that experienced not only colonial genocides, but also theft of history, killing of indigenous people's knowledges and killing of indigenous people's languages. It is about how the, it's about the way of know, how the ways of knowing and what is knowable to people is considered on the margin of particularly these people, me, my people, on the margin of European um, define, definition of humanity. Um, that you know, we want to ask these questions. These ways of knowing and, and the ways of being have been corrupted, destroyed, minimized, and erased. Yeah. So today, despite all the work that's been done, there remains a certain degree of neocolonialism in the academy. Uh, there is a loop-sided political of knowledge production in African studies and other social sciences. So as I see that my time is running out, I'll skip and I'll just explain to you a little bit about what I consider to be a, a manifesto of, of justice. Yeah, because I want to ask the question, I keep having this question in my head, how do you do this in the academy, in institutions that despite some of the efforts and struggles to delink from modernity and universalism, continue to perpetuate discrimination and are often on, on, you know, don't put emancipation at the center of their objectives. Well, this is, this is what uh, Kiana and I myself have been doing and thinking about is to find a map for ourselves. We can have a long conversation about what the university can do. And I think Dr. Bambra will take that over. But for Kiana and me, it was thinking about what is the exercise of decoloniality as a praxis um, how can we work towards uh, pathways of epistemological repair and reimagining in African studies? And uh, I'll simply give the, the big lines and then I, I'll be happy to talk about these more in detail during the question and answer. But the first thing is, you know, we had to do, we have to continue to do our homework. We have to know whose shoulder we, shoulders we stand on. We have to do like uh, Olivia Rutazibwa says, demythalizing, excuse me, systems of knowledge by really understanding and teaching and explaining their foundation in our research. Decolonizing the mind, not only rage and outrage, because those two things are useful and can be productive, but through careful engagement with what is already there. Second, the practice of decoloniality by knowing where you step. And what I call knowing where you step is having a clear mind in your head of Cuyano's colonial power matrix, understanding how control of the economy, how control of gender and sexuality, control of, of knowledge and subjectivity, all of these things are linked. So I have to understand where I step and I have to help my students, uh, you know, get a clear map of what's happening around them. Once you understand the matrix, you can see where you step. You need to diversify epistemic practices, not just for the sake of diversifying, but really understanding and, and trying to see the, 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 the reality that there's different ways of knowing and understanding the world. We need to stop trying to justify our worth and stop trying to prove that we belong. Because in fact, if we don't belong, there are other spaces where we can do this work. We need to excavate new and old research on African from the African archives, despite the limitations of the archive, and most importantly for me as a scholar of gender studies, is really understanding what Oyewumi's work was about, which was not only rethinking gender, but it was the foundation of rethinking power, power distribution, and the state in Africa. Lastly, we need to learn to reimagine. Uh, you can go back to way the, the way things were, um, and neither should you want to go back, but you want to reappropriate and create networks among communities to erase boundaries. Um, and I'm going to end there, but I'm going to do, do last, one last thing. Some people may find that a manifesto like this one is unruly. It risks us slipping away from real science into the world of fiction. Well, consider this. 
given that much of the foundation of which many of on which many of our social sciences are based, which permitted such an equality to exist in the first place, are in fact fiction. And it's sufficient that we continue to teach via erasure, omission, and lack of context and silences. It is not a sin to try fiction or speculative to reinvent better. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Yolan Buka, for that pow those powerful insights in the a manifesto of decolonial justice and African studies. I, I am sure many people uh, were fully engaged and probably like me taking copious notes, but also uh, grateful for the fact that the video of this will be available for them to revisit and rethink and re, uh, um, be re-energized by those insights, which uh, I, I should stress to are supported by the Fulbright um, Scholars Program uh, the American Association of University Women and the Social Science and Humanities Research Council, um, not surprisingly, given the tremendous uh, contributions they make to knowledge and new knowledges and decolonial knowledges and epistemic justice. So our uh, second speaker today, and I am delighted to be able to introduce, is Dr. Gaminda K. Brambera, who is a sociologist and is a professor of post-colonial and decolonial studies at the University of Sussex uh, in the United Kingdom. <clears throat> Dr. Bramber is uh, a fellow of the British Academy um, and a president of the British Sociological Association. She's authored numerous publications, uh, conduct, uh, uh, including colonialism and modern social theory, the award-winning Rethinking Modernity, Postcolonialism and Social Imagination, um, and uh, as well as I, I think um, co-editor of Decolonized in the University uh, 2018, uh, Global Social Theory. Uh, um, she's the editor of Discover Society and directs the Connected Sociologies Curriculum Project. As you will also see, she is the recent recipient of the Levelum Trust Major Research Fellowship on Varieties of Colonialism. Without further ado, please welcome to the virtual stage, Dr. Gaminda K. Brambra. We are honored to have you with us. Hello, thank you so much. So I'd like to um, start by thanking Melinda Smith for the invitation to participate in this conversation. And I very much look forward to the discussion with her and Yolande and all of you that follows our talks. I appreciate you welcoming me to this space and I acknowledge the settler colonial context which we share, albeit virtually for me at the moment, given that I'm coming to you from uh, Brighton in the UK at the moment. Now, Dr. Buka has very nicely set out the political economy and the colonial context of the emergence of modern universities and their associated practices. And so what I'd like to do, which hopefully complements the analysis that she has put forward, is to set out some of the epistemological issues that are at stake here and to think about how we might start the process of resolving some of the problems that she has so pertinently highlighted. The continuing coronavirus pandemic has combined with other global crises to highlight some of the fundamental challenges of social inequality that currently face us. These inequalities are not specific to countries or to particular situations, but they transcend borders and limits. They're both global in their current configuration, and I would suggest also within their historical constitution. And so similarly, any solutions to the challenges represented will also have to be global. And the continuing relevance of the social sciences will rest on their ability adequately to conceptualize the global processes that are involved. And so what I want to do within the time that I have is to think about the way in which the idea of the global is formulated within the social sciences. And I want to suggest that we need to move away from an idea of seeing the global as something that just develops on from the modern, 
even though these two terms are often seen as interchangeable, and rather think about the ways in which empire and colonial relationships more generally have disappeared from such accounts. And um, what I want to do is make the argument for why we need to have a proper accounting of um, the political relations of extraction that bound colonies to metropoles and to think about the ways in which these have defined colonial global economies and how that continues to service national projects in the West. And I'll say more about what I mean in relation to this shortly. I think the key thing that I want to stress at this point is that it's only by acknowledging the significance of the colonial global that it's possible to understand and address the necessarily post-colonial present that is the context for issues of inequality in the present. And so we need to recognize the historical role of colonialism, slavery and indenture in the making of the modern world and through that recognition, what that enables us to do is to examine how these world historical processes have constructed our conceptions of the global in terms of the racialized hierarchies that are embedded both in institutions in many of the ways that Dr. Bucher outlined and also in the development of social scientific concepts and categories. So the lens of coloniality enables us to think about the significance of a specific kind of hierarchical ordering that has, I would suggest for the most part, been implicit to our disciplines and remains largely unacknowledged. And so what I'd like to do within this talk is to think about, is to, so if I've said that these things have been implicit, what would it mean to think about them explicitly? So what I will do first is talk about the limitations of taking the nation as the standard unit of analysis. And I'll argue for the need to consider our colonial past as the basis for thinking about contemporary configurations of the global. I'll follow this with an address of these implications in the present for how we understand questions of citizenship and belonging. And I'll conclude by arguing for a reparatory social science based on a broader understanding of the colonial histories that have shaped our shared global present and its challenges. So just to start with the nation state, I mean, within the social sciences, the nation state is the primary unit of analysis. It's understood to organize the formal international division of the world as well as social relations domestically. When we come to think about questions of global inequality, scholars and you know, sort of famous scholars such as Branko Milanovic, Thomas Piketty, they always tend to organize their analyses in terms of inequality within nations. And they often see global inequality as simply being the sum of all national inequalities. And yet the political entities that they talk about were very rarely nations over the long durée. Rather, they were imperial formations, imperial formations that were created by a colonizing state and colonial territories, or sorry, imperial formations constituted by a colonial state and colonial territories and populations that were asymmetrically incorporated. So this asymmetry of colonialism involved the extraction of wealth and within wealth, I think of labor, resources and taxation, so the extraction of wealth from the colonies, which was appropriated by the colonizing state and used to its benefit. And so as a consequence, it really makes very little sense to compare the economies of Britain and India, for example, over the past two centuries, which both Milanovic and Piketty do, when for 200 years prior to 1947, the wealth of India was largely siphoned off to the benefit of the British economy and social institutions more generally, and to the detriment of the Indian population. Now, what was true of Britain was also true of other European colonial powers, as scholars such as Eduardo Galeano, Walter Rodney, Samir Amin, amongst many others have set out. So the key issue here is the extent to which the failure to acknowledge the colonial relations from which nations subsequently emerged distorts analyses of global inequalities. Now, neither Milanovic nor Piketty is unaware of Europe's long history of colonization, 
It's just that for them, colonial processes are not regarded as significant to the shaping of global inequalities. This is in part because in the same way as many other social scientists, what they do is that they posit a novel post-colonial state, which is often perceived as fragile and at risk of failing. And they contrast that to the modern European nation state but without ever addressing the processes of colonization that were themselves part of state formation for both colony and colonizer. If colonization was taken seriously, then the modern nation state would only be seen to emerge in the period of decolonization, as previous states would more appropriately be understood as imperial or colonial states. So, the concepts and categories that are central to our understanding of social science, they involve particular histories of the nation state and related ideas of modernity and membership. And if those histories don't adequately account for our wider shared past, then the concepts and categories we use will reproduce the very inequalities that we otherwise seek to resolve. The way in which we understand what the state is and how the state is defined, particularly in terms of its contemporary boundaries, but also its historical constitution, these things matter to the shaping of politics in the present, including the shaping of global politics. Among other things, what it does is it defines who belongs and perhaps more importantly, who has the right to belong. At the same time, it also defines who has the right to move and the right to move with rights. And this is an increasingly important political question that confronts us in a variety of locations globally. The analytical distinction that is made within the social sciences between nation and empire stops us being able to understand the past in connected terms. And further, the dominant social science narrative of modernity that's associated with the expansion of citizenship fails to understand that the consolidation of a nation out of an imperial past involves divided membership and the removal of some from membership of the polity at the same time as establishing citizenship for others. So what I'd like to do in this next section is to talk about understanding of citizenship, how they've come about and the associated rights of membership within political communities. Now, in many discussions of modern citizenship, citizenship has been framed in terms of political inclusion within or exclusion from nation states. And these discussions very rarely acknowledge the significance of colonial relations. Although I would point you to the work of Radhika Mongia, who does think about citizenship in the context of the broader empire. I want to go to France, however, and think about the ways in which France comes to be presented as the originary modern nation state. The French Revolution is seen to be central to the establishment of France as modern. And it's in here, conceptions of nationhood and citizenship are seen to emerge and develop around ideas of political unity, and they bear the mark of their origin within the 1789 revolution. Empire is very rarely considered when thinking about citizenship and how it emerges in France. And this is despite the fact that there have been the existence of legal codes such as the Code Noir, which was established in the late 17th century and which regulated the lives of the enslaved in the French Caribbean. It also governed the conditions or it also covered the conditions governing the lives of those who migrated from the colonies to the French national state. And as Tyler Stovall argues, the Code Noir was one of the first major examples of the conflict between political and legal equality on the one hand and racial discrimination and domination of the other within the French state. And when he talks about the French state, he understands the French state as being understood to include its colonial territories. Beyond the Code Noir, however, as David Gegas has argued, there were also many debates during the French Revolutionary period over whether black men could be citizens or whether color itself was a radical obstacle to civic and political equality. In 1791, for example, it was proposed that 
only non-whites born of free parents, not freed men, should be accorded political equality. This limited decree was passed in May of that year and was overturned a couple of months later. Events in Saint-Domingue, which was to become Haiti after its revolution, intensified over the summer as a consequence of this rollback and the largest slave revolt in the history of the Americas ensued. This put further pressure, as Gegas argues, on French legislators to concede full racial equality, which they did in 1792, and eventually slave emancipation, which they did in 1794. And so part of what I'm setting out here is the fact that when we talk about citizenship and we talk about modern citizenship, we often think of that citizenship in terms of the debates that happened within France, but that occurred in the context of what we see traditionally as being the French Revolution. That is what occurs within what's called the hexagon of France. We don't often think about the ways in which events that were happening within the French empire at that time also had a part to play in the debates around citizenship that were happening. Now, whilst the according of full racial equality and emancipation were tremendous achievements, they didn't last very long because Napoleon re-establishes slavery within the French empire in 1802, apart obviously from Haiti, which then uh, makes itself independent from France through its revolution. And he also reconfirms citizenship as the preserve of white men with property. So these, Achievements were tremendous, but not long lasting. But I would suggest that the contestations are significant and they point to more complex histories of, citizen of citizenship and equality than those that are usually presented in such discussion. The failure to transcend racial categories or their own group identity as white is a long-standing feature of European scholarship. This is compounded by the insistence that race only enters Europe and European debates in the post Second World War period. The repercussions of this type of understanding in the present are profound. By not addressing the initial exclusionary movement as I've detailed or then subsequent ones in the context of Algeria and other colonies claimed by France, scholars cannot account for later demands made by those such as the indigens de la République. It's the failure to recognize the colonial relations that shape the political possibilities of the French national project that enables scholars to normalize the group identity of the nation conceived here in homogenous terms and to pathologize the group identities of multicultural immigrants and diverse others. If the political community of France had been extended to include also the colonial possessions of France, then different understandings of equality and citizenship may have been possible. Now, I just want to state here that this isn't a situation specific to France. It's the common condition of many European nations and the European project more broadly. Europe did not become multicultural in the post Second World War period. It was empirically multicultural from the time various European countries began the process of incorporating territories and populations into the ambit of their states and settling the territories of others with their own populations. To say that others were incorporated is precisely not to say that they were included, that is treated as equals. Incorporation points to the hierarchical relations of domination that characterize colonization and come to be reproduced within national polities in the present that fail to account for their colonial histories. European societies have had no difficulty in multiculturalism within a hierarchy of domination, as John Homewood sets out, only with multicultural equality. So the end of colonialism and empire doesn't bring an end to the legacies of its social structures. What I'm trying to demonstrate through this example on citizenship, and I'm really happy to pick it up further in, in questions, is the ways in which the patterns of inequality shaping the world in the present are consequent to those colonial legacies and need to be understood within a connected frame of reference. 
And so how might we do this? What is, what is it that, that I'm arguing for? And here I'll come to my concluding thoughts on the idea of a reparatory social science and what that might look like. The question of reparations has gained increasing salience in recent years. I know there are particular debates that go on in North America in relation to this, but within Europe and thinking about European empires specifically, there's been work by Hilary Beckles and Shashi Tharoor amongst many others who've been arguing variously for reparations for Caribbean slavery, the dispossession and elimination of indigenous populations, and also for colonial drain. And they follow in the footsteps of a number of scholars and activists who, understanding the relationship between colonialism and modernity, question the naturalization within the social sciences of the poverty and equality produced by European expansion. I mentioned Walter Rodney earlier in his classic text, How Europe Underdeveloped Africa, is central to these debates and also the contributions by scholar activists such as Dada Bai Naroji, who wrote the book Poverty and Un-British Rule in India, and Lala Lajpat Rai, who wrote the book England's Debt to India. What they all do is demonstrate the connections between the wealth of Europe and poverty elsewhere as historically produ produced through colonial processes. And it's these connections which have precisely been elided, disappeared, within standard social scientific accounts, which rather focus primarily on the nation and the difference between nations. But if we accept that the global interconnections that brought the world into being as a global entity were colonial, then we need to understand modernity or the modern world itself as a product of that, of those colonial processes. In that sense, there would be less an issue of completing modernity, as Habermas might argue, and more an issue of decolonizing modernity, as Nelson Maldonado Torres would argue. What this involves is an address of the global inequalities established through colonialism, as well as rethinking how we understand those inequalities within our disciplines. And this would include examining the self-understanding of the social sciences, especially in terms of issues of social justice and redistribution. Now, as I've argued elsewhere, and I don't really have time to expand here, but I'm happy to do so in the Q&A, that arguments about welfare entitlements in the present often revolve around questions of belonging and legitimacy. They're framed in terms of the nation and of being able to demonstrate historical belonging to the nation. However, as I've argued, European nations and their settler offshoots have histories that go beyond the national form. And in that case, these sorts of questions need to be rethought in terms of these broader colonial questions. The patrimony of European states and their settler offshoots has never been simply national. It has been established on the basis of their colonial histories. And in that sense, the distribution of that patrimony ought not to be limited by the nation. Rethinking the nation enables us to rethink citizenship, which in turn enables us to rethink how we might address the, gro the global crises that face us. And so a reparatory social science requires both the repair of the social sciences epistemologically, as well as being invested in the collective address of the of the inequalities that are implicitly and sometimes explicitly legitimated by standard social science. Thank you, I'll leave it there. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Brambra, for that discussion, um, which the insightful discussion on um, that calls for rep rep uh, reparatory social sciences uh, as a political scientist. I mean, I, both of us actually, you and, and I, and, and you're a sociologist, I think um, uh, we can both appreciate those insights, but also we are deeply implicated in the ways in which our disciplines uh, are part of this uh, colonial project and the ways in which I think, despite the use of the language of decolonization, um, remain implicated in reproducing a kind of global order 
in which, uh, which marginalizes many in the global South, but also indigenous peoples with, in the territories that we're located on. So I want to begin um, with uh, drawing on the questions in the chat, but also your own discussion. Is this what seems to um, baffle some and, 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 and mindful of many students on, this, on the webinar, this language of um, colonization, decolonization, um, and one of the uh, participants really wanted clarity on the idea of the post. Now, I know in social sciences, we have been dealing with this incessantly. So I'd rather ask a different kinds of question. Um, that is, to, if we can spend more time saying what makes the post somewhat different from the decolonial, so the meaning of the prefix, and then how that relates to what's going on in our disciplines. Um, uh, because I know it, we talk about post-colonial African studies, we talk about post-colonial social sciences, um, but it's that, that post-colonial could exist along with colonial practices. So if we could just spend a few minutes thinking, uh, 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 clarifying for our participants, the, the prefix of, these, of this language. Would you like me to go first or? Yeah, okay. Um, so I, I engaged with the work both of people who call themselves post-colonial scholars and decolonial scholars. And I think the way in which I enter those debates is in reading the work, I don't see that there's necessarily a great deal of difference between the sorts of questions and the modes of analysis of these scholars. But one of the things about academia becomes about finding ways to express the same thing differently. And so I think, partly the proliferation of the language around post and D is, is related to that. What I would say is that when I use the term post-colonial, I don't imagine that we're in a world after colonialism, but that, I, that the, the force of the term post-colonial should require us to consider the colonial in whatever it is that we're talking about. So I guess I use the term post-colonial as a theoretical provocation to consider the colonial and the way in which colonial histories are embedded, but not recognized or engaged with. And so in that sense, it doesn't really have a meaning for me beyond that need to actually reckon with our colonial histories, which for the most part within the social sciences, I don't think we do sufficiently enough. And so that that's the, the, the way in which I would use it. Yeah, I think, thank you so much. I think it's, 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 it's a very nice way to put it. Um, I think when you read one, you in a way have to read the other, however scholars choose to, to label themselves. I think one of the ways in which I was introduced to this type of scholarship was really through the, the kind of the traditional quote unquote post-colonial scholarship, um, Edward Said and so on and so forth in terms of discussing the condition of um, countries that were formerly colonized as not having been transformed and highlighting in many ways, um, the ways in which colonial decolonization as a political process, but also just in terms of aesthetic and understanding and literature and so on and so forth, that process had been interrupted. At least that's how I, I often imagined that particular or actually understood this, this type of scholarship. Um, and, what, um, and what I tend to understand as decolonial scholarship is having the same conversation um, but looking at some of the ideas and challenges that um, that plague our current societies today, and um, you know, I think it, I I see or I understand that scholarship as also an anti-colonial practice, um, much more toward less towards the examination, but also um, a practice of how then do you reverse or how do you change trajectories? And I don't think they're so different, but maybe the orientation and the ways in which decolonial discourses in, in current days have much more embraced this type of decolonial scholarship while stacking it on top 
of more traditional scholars of post-colonial studies. That being said, I think they're often in conversation, <laughs> they understand each other, um, and they are eyeing at the same problem, which is the centering of the colonial moment as one having repercussion well beyond the admission into the United Nations, for instance, right? And, and have material and aesthetic and, and cultural and political ramification uh, well after the end of colonization. I, I, I guess I'm gonna push a little bit more because I actually do think there is a, I, I do think there is a fundamental difference between the post and the decolonial to the extent that I think decolonial scholars, and you both alluded to this in some ways, um, do engage indigenous scholarship uh, and, and other knowledges much more robustly and intentionally than post-colonial scholars who, um, the, or at least the early generation of, of post-colonial scholars who, who by and large uh, go on to continue to uh, cite scholars from the West. So you, Dr. Booker, in your discussion and Dr. Brambra, you both just cited scholars globally. <laughs> and that actually is not a practice I see many post-colonial scholars, at least in Canada, do quite robustly. So, how, so I'm thinking about how do you decenter your centrism and how do you recenter indigenous knowledge or indigenous knowledge systems without actually intentionally being mindful about things like citation, would be a reading and citational practices? And so, so that's one part of my comment, as, a, as, as, as I think what is an important difference between the post and the D colonial school. But I also guess I want to say something about this in our disciplines. Can we actually transform or decolonize or repair social sciences or African studies without being more attentive to, uh, if not, you said, you said the, you used the word of the archives, uh, Yolan, but I think what about the, the, the bibliography or the syllabus, which continues to recenter probably uh, uh, scholars from seven countries in Europe? Which I, I want to. <laughs> I want to to respond to that because I think you're 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 making a very very compelling point, um, and I also want to add, you know, when we talk about decolonizing uh, and decolonization, depending on where we're situating, we're having com different conversation, and this is something that I mentioned in my in my remarks. Um, having come back to Canada after almost twenty years abroad, um, you know, the con the type of conversation around decolonization and and. and you know, returning the land and, and what that actually means and environmental catastrophe having started before what we currently talk about, the environmental crisis that we're currently going on, are quite um, are in conversation, but there are still different claims that are being made about um, intellectual decolonization and, and physical decolonization in the place where I work the most, which is in Africa. Um, so depending on the context and depending on who's your, who you're having a conversation with, you will mean different things by these words, in my view. Um, but the, the sites of decolonization and the site of intellectually thinking about that process in the university, while there are definitely points where they connect are also quite different. And I also think that, um, you know, this is one of the challenges I ask as well, is it possible to decolonize in the academy. And this is the, the conversation that many scholars are having. Uh, some are much more cynical about the possibility of decolonizing within an institution that is creating two discipline and to put in categories, whether it's in terms of where we're affiliated. I'm affiliated with political studies. I do a little bit of gender, but I'm not currently in gender studies. These disciplinary boundaries uh, discipline us the way we have to write and publish discipline us in a particular way. There's pushback, but for terms of, you know, promotion and for, for issues of getting your tenure and permanence and being able to teach what you want to teach, there, depending on the, where you're situated in the in university, there are conditions to be met that are in their very essence in many ways colonial. 
So this is one of the challenges, you know, as you're asking these questions about in a university to two professors and with you included and other people in the audience, um, we, 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 we talk decolonizing in the, in the colonizing space. So when you're referring to the syllabus, you know, luckily for me, the department where I am is allowing me to at least introduce students to the type of scholarship they usually don't uh, engage with on a regular basis. Um, but when I remember teaching about something very basic, the fact that, you know, Canada had slavery and Canada and Quebec, there was a lynching in, in Montreal. Right? This was a simple, the lynching of, 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 of Angelique was a simple fact at the graduate level. Most of the students in class were Canadian students and they had never heard of that. This erasure, um, and for me, I, I often say Canada is a master at myth making, um, is one of the first step. We may not accomplish everything, but unearthing the erasure, digging for the archives and changing what and how we teach is only a first step. After that, there's issues of funding, there's issues of access, there's issues of many things that, you know, Melinda Smith, you work on a daily basis in. Um, but there's the intellectual that is linked to the practice, but we often get caught in the intellectual without really noting what are the steps in our day to day that we can take in our own place to make those changes. And I think this is where, um, you know, I, I really kind of look at mo particularly modern decolonial scholars who are not only thinking, but they're also doing the work uh, in various, very courageous ways. Yes, I mean, I, I, I would uh, agree very much with what Yolanda has said there, in part because, you know, the work of decolonization is work that happens within the world. It's social, it's political, it's economic. There, there are aspects to it, it's structural. It has to be about the address of the structures of inequality. What we call decolonizing within the academy, I would much rather call making the university better making the way in which we teach better and not sort of get caught within that language because then we get into debates about that language rather than doing the work that it's important for us to do in order to make and and to, to make to make the change that or to initiate and implement the changes that we think we need to make in order to open up the spaces for different sorts of work to be able to happen so in that sense, you know, we're caught in this bind that for me, the work that I do, I see as contributing, hopefully, to this larger project. But it's work that I do in a very specific space. And it's a space of thinking about the ways in which the disciplines have emerged, thinking about the ways in which they shape what it's possible for us to know and how it's possible for us to know, and thinking about what work needs to be done in a sense, within those disciplines to break them down and then to rebuild them so that they're more adequate for the purposes that we wish to use them for. So I don't think that there's anything to recover from somewhere else. I don't think there's anything new that will do this. For me, the issue is, is how do we deconstruct what we regard to be problematic and then reconstruct it so it's more adequate to the sorts of things that we wish to do. And that sometimes gets called decolonizing, but I don't see it in those terms, you know, but, but I don't see it as separate from that work. But these are all different bits and none of this is going to happen through any one of us. It's only going to happen in collaboration, in conversation together and with people on the streets. It's not going to happen in our seminar rooms. I, 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 I do want to, <laughs> well, I mean, I, I, I guess the part, another question I have is then how, when, we, when, we, when we imagine kind of uh, epistemic decolonization or epistemic pluralism or ecologies of ecologies. Um, it does invite us to think about, when I think of repairing the social sciences, for example, or decolonizing uh, this manifesto for African studies, it does in a way require us to think about 
epistemic questions of epistemology, right? As we, as you both noticed, noted. Um, but then also to think about how we iterate into the academy, and particularly in the uh, in the metropolitan centers, um, other knowledges, and I'm thinking indigenous knowledges, and maybe that's because of territory and place uh, in, in, in Canada. But also, I think about Latin America, or Asia, um, Africa. Um, you know, we can say African studies, but we don't necessarily mean African indigenous studies. Um, and so I still, I, I'm still uh, wanting to think about how we can, is that a reclamation project? Is that a um, repair? Or is that an un unsettling and displacement? Uh, I, think, I think this is where we are in this current moment. And so I would, I mean, I, I think, I'm not sure that the social sciences are grappling with the indigenous, with indigeneity in the same way uh, across these territories. And uh, they are certainly worthy of consideration. But this might lead me, so hold on to that thought, to the, one of the questions in the chat, which is uh, more to speaking about this question about the, the limitations of the nation state, and, and particularly the way in which it known, it shapes uh, the academy, but also our thinking, much of our thinking in the social sciences. And, and, the, and the, the questioner is um, pointing us to the work of Nandita Sharma and Harsha Walla, uh, uh, Walia, uh, uh, whom you uh, both know, the work you know, and whether we need to think through the regressive forms of renewal, but always according to the question, they're a racist nationalisms, how that shapes the work. So what, and, 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 and Dr. Bramber, they're asking, what is your sense of this? Is the nation state as a concept, let alone a ter territorial and state-based form, wholly inadequate to the work of the decolonial futures? I think you suggested, I mean, you, you spoke to this a bit in, uh, in your work and they would want some, they want some more elaboration. And then there are other ways to are there other ways to think about implications of jurisdictions and authority enabling self determination. So that was a question that was directly for you in relation to the Nate York discussion about the nation state. And, okay, and, and Dr. Booker, you can speak to that as well. So what I'd like to say is that you know, it, and it 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 hangs on how we come to understand the nation. So when we think about the nation and we think about the standard histories that we have of the nation, some disciplines might go back to the Treaty of Westphalia, 1648, the idea of the emergence of the modern state and the state system. And they often then go to the French Revolution, the idea of the modern nation as emerging in the French Revolution. Then Germany and Italy become nations in the late 19th century. And then eventually after decolonization, all these other countries become nations. But the thing is, if in decolonization, you have the emergence of new nations, what are they emerging from? They're emerging from having been colonial territories. And if you're colonized, then there's a colonizer. And a colonizer and a colonized doesn't constitute a nation, it constitutes an empire. So the things that we've been calling nations have actually been empires. And so I would make the argument that the only point at which nations have become predominant within our global system has been in the post second world war period after decolonization that's the period of nation states and then what do we do we compare these new nation states with old nation states but the old nation states were empires not nations so when we say in the present oh look at all these new nations they aren't as good as these old nations had been they're not as successful they're not as wealthy they're not as developed well, the old nations developed on the basis of imperial extraction. They colonized other populations, annihilated them, took their land, took their resources, taxed them, appropriated all their wealth in order to develop their nation through that process. So if now what we call new nations are attempting to build themselves within their own terms, there's no way they can compete with what we had previously known as nations. So, and then the question or the answer becomes a little bit more complicated still, because I think that the, the nation can be seen to be progressive to the extent that it's associated with projects of self-determination and decolonization, and some national forms go on to reproduce some of the very colonial forms uh, 
from which they had sought independence. So the way in which we see some new nations come now to reproduce the very activities and processes of some old nations. And so in that sense, it's not, you know, in these issues, they're very complicated. And so I wouldn't wish to argue against the nation as regressive to the extent that it's allied to an anti-colonial movement. And then I also recognize the way in which some forms of nationalism to the extent that they become exclusionary and reproduce certain patterns are then problematic as, as well. So in that sense, it's what is the nation doing? It's not the nation can be judged just as the nation. It's what's being done in the name of the nation is partly the question. Thank you. I, I, I definitely, you know, <laughs> vibe with um, what you've, you've just talked about. And I, you know, I often ask my students, because when you're talking about the new nations and the old nation, one thing that often bothers me is the myth associated with what the nation used to be. Um, and, you know, I simply take the example of France because you, you've done such a good, um, you know, jo job at explaining to us kind of this issue as well of, of citizenship and the role that the revolution played and the role that Haiti played in the conversations about determining who could belong and who couldn't. But even within the Exagon, right, um, the, the level of violence that was deployed in the name of the nation in order to subjugate people who spoke different languages, lived differently, embraced different religions within that particular territory for quite a long time. I often ask my students, go in on the Google and then, you know, and, and Google, you know, French massacres, and then kind of look at the ways in which violence was necessary. You now, we often think about this, um, this, uh, I forgot the name of the scholar um, that I had to, to memorize when I was in, in, in my master's project about the, this imagined community, Benedict Anderson kind of idea of the nation, right? People kind of technology and then people agreeing and, and Renan's definition of nation as well of people agreeing. And I'm like, there's, a, quite, a, there's quite a bit of technology of violence involved in creating, you know, people who will fit in that box. Right. And these old nations I've often imagined as, as people voluntarily entering into Rousseau's version of the social contract without actually thinking about how many people actually had to die to be subjugated into that box. And then they compare that with in the case of the place that I study is Africa and people refusing not only to, 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 to necessarily be part of a nation, but also being refusing or challenging the legitimacy of who has control over the territory, right? And this legitimacy is often more so external than internal in some cases. Of course, things evolve and change depending on regime. So for me, this has been a challenge. And secondly, and this is something that people who've heard me talk before, particularly with regards to issues of gender, um, I'm looking at work, um, particularly coming from South Africa, um, uh, you know, interrogating, you know, what is the role of, you know, here slipping, in this, you know, into the state in the protection of, of women and what is the role of the state in, in, in this idea of the social contract. And I interrogate very much so the ways in which we make assumptions, particularly for women, about how that state is supposed to protect you. And so it's not just a, a question of conceptual limitation of what the nation is, but what it was supposed to represent in the West was the nation state and its supposed role in terms of protection. And what we often see is that, particularly in, the, in this era, is the way in the state protects capital much more than it's in, in interested in protecting individuals and people, and particularly people who are, uh, you know, uh, female body individuals and women and racial and linguistic and religious minorities. Uh, so, you know, for me, I often sit in discomfort in taking these concepts for granted particularly when there were political and social um, uh, organization that seemed to fit people differently in other places. We've all agreed that the state is there to stay and that somehow the nation fits in it. But 
there's discomfort about what that nation actually represents, even in North America, even in Europe. Right. So um, I definitely sit uncomfortably with with those concepts and definitely think that there are quite um, conceptual limitations, some of which the, the colonial conversations are actually ta tackling these very, these very, um, these very, you know, uh, various points of discomfort. Thanks. So I'm going to go to another question in the chat and link it up uh, to um, some of the arguments you both made. And that is this idea that when you start talking about epistemology and ontology, and, 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 and both of you did try to connect it to political economy and structures, but that, 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 that um, the relationship, some folks have a hard time connecting the dots. So I'm gonna ask for your elaboration in this. And one of the, one of the questions is, um, is it not that we are all just getting caught up in the language and symbolism and non-action in contrast to substance and action? So, it just, so you know, epistemological questions, ontological questions often get seen as um, um, just, just a discussion, not just talk. Um, would do we say to communities who are tired of thinking and want to get on with the doing? And, and, and you know, so, because much of our, much of the work that we are thinking, uh, are talking about in terms of decolonization does require rethinking thinking, does require uh, thinking about unlearning, learn uh, things that we have learned. Um, and much of this conversation is happening, the university's a site of a lot of this conversation, um, but people who are unlearning and rethinking thinking cannot fully connect these questions, um, uh, these kind of epistemic and existential issues to racism or enslavement, histories of racism or enslavement and colonialisms or racial capitalisms, uh, or uh, your, uh, Dr. Buki, the work you talk about, about heteropatriarchy or any of these kinds of things, they simply can't. So what does one do for, the, for folks who have a, a, a difficult time connecting the one set of questions with the question of justice and justice as practice in the political economy in this current moment? Big question, but in a way, I think some of the questions in the chat reflect the, the, the what some see as a gap between this, these, the one set of questions and then the, the everyday practice to change, to transform the, structure of, uh, the structures of inequality and including the, the, the lived ex experiences of inequality and racism uh, in the everyday. Who wants to start? I don't mind. Uh starting and perhaps I'll do it through a sort of a, a personal account because in a sense you know so I, I grew up here in Britain and as I grew up here I was constantly or my understanding was that I was an immigrant because that's what teachers told me that's what school told me that's what the media told me the way in which the way I look the the family background that I have everything about me was that I was an immigrant to this country to to Britain and in the context of, you know, we had these debates around leaving the European Union about five years ago, Brexit, you might know it as, and uh, one of the things that came up then was what, what we want to do in this country is to take back our sovereignty from Europe and be a free and independent and sovereign nation. And in the context of work that I was doing at that time, looking at questions of citizenship and so on, one of the things that became really clear to me is that, well, actually, Britain's never, never been a nation. Britain has always been an empire. So from the very beginning of when Britain comes to be established in 1707, it's already an empire because it already has colonies. So the coming together of England and Scotland create it as an empire. It goes on to colonize much of the world, including where my family's from, which is India. And my ancestors are British subjects. They're British subjects of empire. The first passport my grandfather ever gets is a British passport because at that time he's in Kenya. Kenya is still a British colony. To travel from India to Kenya, the papers he gets to travel from, you know, British India to British Kenya 
the papers he gets are that he's a British subject. And then when he goes from Kenya to Britain, the papers he gets are that he's a British subject. And then he becomes a British citizen in 1948 when Britain establishes the British Nationality Act, which gives British citizen to everybody who's in Britain and its colonies. So there was no difference in citizenship between if you lived in Britain or you lived in the colonies, it was exactly the same shared common citizenship. So if for as long as there have been passports, my family has had a British passport, why now do I get called an immigrant in this country? Whereas to be an immigrant is to cross a political border, is to cross a line that demarcates one political territory from another political territory. The territories my family moved in were always the British Empire. They didn't move from one independent country to another independent country. They moved within colonial and imperial circuits. But the reason why most people would think of me as an immigrant is because they think of Britain as a nation, not as an empire. So to make that change, which is a change that some people might think, oh, well, it doesn't really make any difference. Well, it makes a difference to the possibility of politics in the present. It makes a difference to whether I get understood as a migrant or as a citizen, which is not to say that we should treat migrants badly, but it's to say that we should reconstruct our categories according to the histories that make them up and then rethink what is possible politically in relation to those categories. So in that sense, I hope I've made a link between why it's important to rethink the standard assumptions that dominate our thinking and how that opens up the possibility of a different sort of politics in the present. For me, it's, it's, it's uh, I always find these questions interesting because I think it goes back to um, one of the points I made about my minding where you step. Um, you know, understanding um, what is happening um, around you in order to engage in the right type of activities and emancipatory activities. Obviously, people have different, um, people do different work, right? But what I've seen a lot of intellectuals of my generation and previous generations who are engaged in this work is you know, a lot of labor is involved, not just in terms of intellectualizing these differences and categories, but teaching. I mean, this is the place where we operate, teaching, um, you know, in our own community, there's, there's an, I don't wanna use the word imagine, but there's often a, a perception that people who think about these things only think about them and are not actually involved in movements and communities around them. And if you think about somebody like Rodney, for instance, who was an intellectual, but he was politically involved, he was involved in movements and he paid dearly for that. Um, so I think it's true that the ivory tower tends to protect and tends to make it difficult to disseminate knowledge in a way that is accessible to the public. But I see routinely in the past few years that I've been in academia, a deliberate effort to lower these barriers in spite of resistance for keeping to keep them up, to make the language legible, to make it sense and to connect the relationship between the university and slavery and the university and the carceral system. Right. And I say this as somebody who works in Kingston, where you have multiple detention centers and there's a relationship between militarism, the university and the carceral system, whether or not we, we, we want to see it. Those relationships are about minding our steps, understanding where we are, where we're going so that our engagement is productive. Um, and in fact, many activists who are outside of academia have actually provided much more robust articulation of some of these structures that we consider non-academic work, but is in fact extremely theoretical. Being able to have kind of this bird's eye view in order to have efficient type of mobilization and coming together and work and pushing forward or resisting together goes hand in hand. And, and whether we are here or elsewhere, there's always been a link. It's just that academia often tries to put barriers 
and you know the work of uh, you know what they call a scholar activist, which is really frowned upon in some circles, um, is really that of of building the bridge between the the material things and the thing that we think about and intellectualize because they go together absolutely. We have come to the end of our conversation today, not the end of this conversation. And I want to thank you. Uh, and, and, and I think that's a good place to, 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 to close on, but also the ways in which you have, you, you have both highlighted the importance of this, these, these, this kind of thinking uh, and its connection to questions of freedom, questions of emancipation, questions of justice. Um, that you cannot, you cannot transform the everyday to make it more just or fair unless we think through some of these, uh, these, these difficult uh, issues that you've highlighted. And if we, unless we actually think through how we lead to a repertory uh, social science, such as this, because I think social science and humanities are indispensable to these conversations, and how we think about the need to craft a manifesto for change. So I greatly appreciate the interventions you've made and for those of you who are online, the, the, the resources shared in the chat will be, some of them will be available on our website. So with, with that, uh, I wanna say thank you to both of our uh, speakers, uh, Dr. Buka and Dr. Bambra um, for, the, for the great insights and encourage members, uh, participants on the webinar to again, follow up with those links. I want to also add that the courageous conversations will be taking place throughout the remainder of this term, this academic term, um, and, the, and I, the discussions will continue to be, I hope, um, important and transformational and, uh, and much needed. And I want to thank you all virtually for your willingness to be part of these discussions. Um, it matters to us, and I think it matters to our world. And it's what we need, I think, to build momentum for change. So thank you to our panelists for your wisdom uh, and for the collective wisdom it facilitates in that. Thank you for your frank and open uh, participation to those putting questions in the Q&A. Thank you to all of you who have been with us today. Uh, for more information on Courageous Conversations, please uh, go to our website at ucalgary.ca forward slash equity dash diversity dash inclusion. Please look for the link to the Courageous Conversation page for more information on these talks and for further information on our speakers. Uh, the, the webinar will be shared uh, to all of those who registered but it will also be housed on our website. Each speaker will have a full list of the readings and resources available on our site and event along with contact information. So again, we are greatly appreciative of your participation and willingness to have these conversation. And we wanna thank Dr. Bramber who is in the middle of the night in the UK for um, staying up and joining us. And we want to wish Dr. Buka well on her Fulbright trip to uh, the, uh, the continent. I just call, I refer to it as the, the continent um, the, uh, uh, on Tuesday. So again, thank you. And I wish you well for the rest of the day. Thank you very much. <laughs>